أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد I'm really excited about uh, the topic we have planned. I I think it's a massive topic, Islamic education in America, and I think we are coming at it from three very different angles. So we'll hopefully try to touch on general principles of what Islamic education should be and what sort of the goal of an Islamic education is. Like, what is education? What does it mean to be taught? What does it mean to learn in an Islamic framework? Um, like, what? how does that differ from how we conceive of education and being an educated person um, in America today? Um, and then move on to sort of uh, higher education and where Islam fits in um, both as a subject of study, both as a topic of study. So what is the history of Islamic studies and the study of Islam in the Western Academy and in um, the Western University? And then finish with sort of what these higher uh, education institutions can and should look like and what our um, plans are moving forward um, as we sort of build out the institutional apparatus in this country, inshallah. So first... I'd like to introduce um, Sayyid Hassanani Rizvi, uh, who graduated from Rutgers in 2007, where he focused his studies on politics and religion in the Middle East and Islamic world. He studied subjects such as Islamic jurisprudence, the Arab-Israeli conflict, democracy and reform in post-revolutionary Iran, American foreign policy, defense policy, terrorism and international relations, Israeli politics and Islam, democracy and violence in the Islamic world. He did Islamic studies at the Imam Ali Seminary from 2012 to 2000, was from 2010 to 2012 and then studied in Qom from 2014 to 2020. Um, he, his education is very extensive and so is his teaching um, um, across across America and across topics um, from democracy, capitalism, materialism, the relationship between science and religion, atheism, postmodernism, etc. And has been now has been serving as a resident alim for the Husseini Islamic Center in Orlando, Florida since April 2020. We're very lucky to have him with us and without further ado um, on the topic of tarbiyah and Islamic education for youth. With the salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad, please. A'udhu billahi s-sami al-alim min ash-shaytan al-la'in al-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ahla baytahi al-tayyabin al-tahirin. Allahum salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Mu'mineen, mu'minat, brothers and sisters in Islam and Iman. Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So I want us to first start off by thinking of this idea, right? A lot of the times we add this word Islamic in front of a lot of different things. So obviously for the perspective of this workshop, we're doing it in front of education. I want to try to see if there's a distinction between the idea of Islamic education and an education system that just has happens to have Muslims involved in it. So. Again, there's a lot of discussion there. I don't want to do too much, but I think a clear kind of superficial example might make it clear. Do you guys think that a Muslim could run a casino? Well, somebody can be a Muslim and own and run a casino, right? They'd be doing something haram, but they'd still be Muslim, right? Are the burgers haram? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so you can have a Muslim run casino, a casino that has Muslims involved. Would you ever have something like an Islamic casino? So, no. See there, because now you're thinking in the back, okay, what does Islam mean? What are the principles involved? And for us, it's, it's a contradiction. It doesn't work. So the same way, I want us to reflect on that idea in terms of education. A lot of the educational institutions that we think about, especially in, in the West, people have tried to develop something for Muslims without thinking that there might be an Islamic way of developing these institutions, right? Whether there's an actual philosophy of education, right? Islamic pedagogy, for example. So, and I'm sure obviously the, the, these two uh, scholars here will go through that. 
So I want to take it all the way back to the beginning, because in order for us to get to this end result where we're thinking about Islamic education in the higher form, right, higher learning, the part of lower learning is essential too, right, which starts at the home, which starts with tarbiyah, which starts with schooling and everything. So I wanted to first start off by giving us some basic idea of what tarbiyah or education happens to be. There's a lot of different definitions. I want to go through at least just one definition that's been given by um, Ayatollah Ali Raza Arafi. And he's one of the ulama who's in some way gone through what we call the fiqh of tarbiyah, right? The fiqh of educational jurisprudence, so to speak, right? So what does that mean? So, uh, and this is my rough translation of his definition of what upbringing or education looks like. So he calls it a supportive process for a trainer or an educator that is established to create gradual transformation over a certain range of time in either the physical, mental, spiritual, or behavioral realms which occurs through another human agent in order to acquire their human perfection and flourish and or unlock their potentials, capabilities, and also to deter and correct traits and behaviors. So that's a lot different than what we think about education normally, right? The things that at least should hopefully stick out to us for this kind of definition is there's a holistic em uh, element in Islamic education. It's not just this acquired sort of knowledge where here, here's some mathematics for you, memorize these formulas, here's Newton's laws, just take that information. From us being over here in the West, the general perspective that I think we've been inculcated, or if I might be so bold, I'd say brainwashed with, is the sort of modernist perspective where education is simply just a tool and a function for a capitalist system, and that's it. Meaning, your education is only valuable in as much, as, um, as much capital that you can produce. So that's why we have this blue-collar, white-collar distinction. So education that creates blue-collar workers is naturally looked down upon for some reason. Whereas if you are produced into a white-collar industry, sometimes that's, you know, that's much higher education. Right? We see these people as being distinguished, for example. Why? Because they're creating more capital, whether actual capital, you know, physical capital, intellectual capital, whatever it is. But the spiritual component doesn't exist in any of this. Well, obviously, with the Islamic component, that's, it's part and parcel, and it is the whole end goal. Right? The idea is to reach this kamal, to reach this human perfection. So as we're going through this, we're, again, our mindset is trying to think about, we're trying to get somebody involved, and hopefully, to some group of individuals, not everybody, to think about higher Islamic education. So our mindset, we're trying to set ourselves up for this higher education learning. And I think it would be unjust if we just assume that everybody is going to be interested in that. I mean, even think about just the Hawza in general. Let's be honest, most people, if your kids came up to you and said, I want to go for higher, you know, higher learning, higher education. Like, okay, great, you know, which university? You want to do a master's, PhD, what do you want to do? Oh, I want to go to the Islamic seminary. Oh, okay. Are you sure about that? Like, do you know what that entails? Like, you know, when you come back, you might have to, you know, the, the money thing comes to mind a lot, right? Even my own father, Marhum, he questioned me on that too when I decided I wanted to go. Even though he respected it and he understood it, he said, I don't want you to come back and just be like everybody else and have to, you know, kind of beg. And, you know, it was the capital, the financial portion that hit his mind, and was, which I understood completely, right? It's a, it's a matter of dignity to some degree. So there's a, there's some steps that I think are missing when we, before we even get to this idea of higher education. You know, what kind of people, or more importantly, what kind of community needs to be created in order to get people to think and believe and support something like higher education? Whether it's institutions that are, you know, overseas, whether it's ones that are over here, whether it's a traditional sort of seminary, whether it's a uh, more of a westernized system, whatever you want to call it. How do you get people even thinking on those lines? And it's only going to happen if the proper preliminaries and prerequisites are set up, right? The muqaddamat. You have to have these set up. In a house or in an environment with kids that the sole goal, the sole thing, the things that are being talked about are nothing but dunyawi principles. Again, it's the capitalistic mindset that many, that I heard at least growing up, I'm sure many of you, if you were raised here too, it was, look, these are the jobs and these are the industries that will get you right where you need to be meaning get you money. Well, why does that matter? Like, well, then this is how, you know, typically a parent would trace it. You need to get good grades in school, right? Go to your school, get good grades. After you get good grades, that'll help you get into these AP classes or CP classes, you do well on your SATs, or I don't even know what kind of tests exist nowadays, but whatever, you get placed well, when that happens, then you get to go to a good college, 
you go to the good college, you know, uh, maybe get scholarships, whatever, those good colleges, then you can finally move on to a good job, that good job, then maybe somebody will actually marry you, right? So that was the sort of tentative and that say it and that whole line that they're, they're painting. Right? A lot of us were painted like that. So there's no discussion in that movement about spiritual journey. How, like, would anybody ever say, look, you can go to school and if you like it, great. If you don't like it, no problem. If you want to go up and let's say do some, I, I don't want to mention trades because it might be offensive to some, but let's just say what we'd call traditional blue, blue collar work where somebody's actually getting their hands dirty, which may not make as much money as, you know, white collar sort of work. Would ever as parents, we think of things like, you know, son, daughter, you, if you even go to that, as long as you are closer to Allah through it, then go ahead. It's fine. Most of that wouldn't occur to us, right? We wouldn't be thinking in those lines. So the tarbiya initially, we have to start and figure out, okay, is it, are we setting it up for this objective of higher education? And now this higher education, what is that? This is a, this qurb, right? This closest to Allah. Allah is, is ilm and nothing but ilm, right? This is the source of knowledge and he is all knowledge. And everything that we understand and learn should be directed back towards him. Is that the sort of model that we're going for? Or again, is it just used as a tool and a wasila for making money, starting a family, and that's it? Because if it's the former, again, or sorry, if it's the one that's just the capitalistic mindset, then this higher education system, the Islamic version, it's non-existent. It's not going to work. It won't enter into our minds. It's not going to happen. When we can start early on with children and say, look, you know, whether it's this kind of simple ways we talk about nurture or nature, but, you know, look at Allah all around you. Do you want to know the depths that Allah's created? Well, it's in mathematics, it's in these you know, physical sciences, it's in the social sciences, it's, it's, in, it's in everything. And child, maybe if they're inquisitive, they want to learn more and more. Okay, well, there's legal rules that uh, surround this as well too. All of these things are interconnected. You know, how far do you want to take this? So when that is inculcated and started off with children early on in the household, and ideally they're seeing their parents do the same thing too. Right? When they, you know, they always say, when you see a parent read and ask questions and say, I don't know, the child will be able to repeat the same thing too. Say, okay, my parent, my dad, my mom, they're researchers, they ask questions, they say, I don't know, then that means there's always this infinite journey to something higher. So I, I'm going to follow in those footsteps. Okay. So that's, again, just quick, some quick words about tarbiyah in general. Now, okay, beyond the tarbiyah thing, the sort of second step, let's say the famous sort of tradition beyond the zero to seven phase. Now we're moving on to, let's say, the lower level of education, like schooling, early schooling. Right now, there's a huge debate, right? We all know about the LGBTQ stuff that's happening and all the sort of leftist stuff that happens in schools. Leave that aside for a second and just think more about many people's, their alternatives. Many are switching to homeschooling for those reasons. Many are switching to Islamic schooling. I know many who were switching to, sorry. No, no, sorry. Oh, I thought you raised your hand. Quotes about around Islamic schooling. Yeah, I'm glad you did that, yeah. Because uh, that, yeah, that's exactly the point. And I've heard some based on that, because of the quotes, they say, yeah, we looked at these so-called Islamic schools, which are, again, just schools for Muslim kids. We actually are, seem like we're better off dropping off in a private Christian school because it seems like they're teaching these holistic, godly principles better than our own Muslim schools are doing or Islamic schools are doing. So the way that we're thinking about these education systems also is going to matter. I, again, I don't want to tell everybody how to raise your kids, what schools to send them in. I just want to get us to think about trying to set somebody up in the long term, right? What this higher education thing means. So in that respect now, as we're thinking about that, if you can recite us, Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Most of these schools, you know, I've been around the country. I've seen all these, again, uh, forgive me, attempts at Islamic schools, which again, I'm going to call schools for Muslims. It's basically this, the typical just westernized system, right? They'll grab onto Montessori or Waldorf. They'll grab something else. And then there's a Bismillah maybe at the beginning. There's a Dua Faraj maybe at the end. And they've named that an Islamic school. And maybe that's the most they can achieve. You know, Allah knows their niyat and intention, fine. But is there much more achievable than there? Like, is, is that the limit of Islamic education? Like, is that actually Islamic education? Or is there a way that, no, all of these sciences, in the way that traditionally it has been done in the Muslim world, that these, there was no separation. There was no secular and then Islamic. It was all just manifestations of God and everybody's just trying to understand that. Is that the way that it's being presented in, in these sort of schooling systems? One quick example. So 
normally you have, let's say, one class that will talk about, let's say you're talking about uh, the sun. Okay, this is the sun and, you know, temperature. This is what the sun does and orbiting stuff, planets. You know, where they talk about it in astronomy for a kid. Okay, then they do that. Then maybe they have a separate fifth class. And in the fifth class, they'll talk about Tahara and Najasa. One of the things on the list will be, okay, water can purify, the sun can purify under certain conditions, whatever. So, and then maybe you have a separate Quran class where you're trying to get the kids to just learn and read the Quran and memorize it. All of these things have been completely separated. Not intentionally, but in a sense, intentionally. There's another system where if an educator understands the interconnectedness of all this, let's say they start the class for, again, this is just an example. They start the class with Surat al-Shams, reciting that. Then they say, let's talk about al-Shams, the sun. So now there's already Arabic and Quran being taught there. So, okay, what is the Shams there for? And maybe you have, again, for younger kids, you have some sort of physical activity. Maybe they're painting, letting it dry outside. Okay, how did this thing dry? Oh, it's the sun that did it. Like, okay, besides this, do you know what else it can dry? When something, for example, becomes nudges and it's attached, the sun can actually purify something that's nudges too. You've just made a whole Islamic sort of curriculum on one concept of the sun without having to separate it into separate classes. So now the mind of a child too is that, okay, the sun is like that. That means the moon is like that. That means the earth is like that. That means the orb, every single thing now is going to have this interconnectedness. When these classes are separated, then you're already separating somebody and thinking that these things are all disconnected from God. Or that there's an Islamic sense of knowledge, which is like fiqh and usul and whatever the Islamic sciences are, Quran. And then there's the sciences that are separate, which again, in the back of their mind, that's the one that gets you a job and makes you money. So as, uh, yeah, I want to kind of end here because I want to give time to everybody else. Yeah, let me just, I think I'll stop here because I think I'd rather more discussion happen from there. So I'm going to end on a weird note, but I, hopefully it's gotten you to think, and then we'll see what the other scholars can add on from that. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. No, Jazakallah khair. That was excellent. I, um, me, we were having such a similar discussion right before this thing happened, and I think you put words to a lot of the things I was trying to articulate very very well. And it's a subtle shift, you know, like, it's not like, oh, at an Islamic school, there's no gym class. It's like, no, but the, the act of cultivating your body and having a strong body and, and sort of like doing physical labor is inherently part of the Islamic project. It's part of, it's because your body is an amana from God. It's something that's been entrusted to you. And it's like, everything becomes sort of subsumed into this larger project of achieving closeness to Allah or achieving spiritual perfection. And then everything has a purpose. You know, you're not sitting in math class. Like, why am I doing this? Like, I think so many students, they go to these classes and they're like, why are we, my brother is, is like this. He's like, why am I learning this? He's like, I can just do drop shipping and make a lot of money. And it's like, because these things are so divorced from meaning, you know, they're so divorced from the project of becoming a good human that it does, it does feel meaningless, you know? Why do you need to learn these equations? So I think, um, yeah, a holistic uh, sort of, a holistic approach to Islamic uh, education is, is, I think, the big thing that's missing in, in our Islamic schools. We think Islamic means no haram. If there's no haram in the classroom, then then we've achieved something Islamic. So thank you, Jazakallah. I think, I hope we can continue this discussion uh, in our conversation. Um, let's sort of uh, zoom out a bit. Um, I mean, I don't know if zoom out is the right word. Let's sort of uh, <laughs> transition, uh, take, a, take our, um, take our telescope and look elsewhere um, at the issue of the study of Islam. So Islam as a topic and how it's sort of approached in institutions of higher learning. And for that, I'll pass the mic to Dr. Hussein Kamadi, who is the Imam Ali Chair in Shia Studies and Dialogue among Schools of Thought at Hartford University. Before obtaining his PhD and his MA, both in history from Columbia University, he earned an MSc degree in mathematics, statistics, and operations research from New York University. And his undergraduate degree was in com computer and electrical engineering from Shahid Beheshti University in Iran. Um, but you know, on in the in the spirit of of this panel and sort of the questions we're raising in this panel, these accolades are not what give these scholars the the sort of um, authority to be speaking to us today, but it is rather the quality of their hearts and the fact that they are 
up, upstanding individuals who have dedicated their lives to righteous pursuits that make us make them um, make them sort of beacons for us. So, I invite uh, Dr. Kamali to begin with a salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. <laughs> Tarbiya does not end with children. Tarbiya is not for children only. It's for all of us. So it's, there is also adult education for Muslims. How are we going to study Islam, to represent Islam? Who is going to speak for Islam? Who is going to represent Islam? These are important questions. Now, one aspect of this, a very important aspect of this is learning, to know. We have to know the extremely rich traditions that have evolved over the past 1400 years or so under the name of Islam. We have to know that, we have to internalize it, we come from various traditions ourselves. And then the point is, how do we represent this? Now, Sayyid Rizvi spoke with perfect New Jersey accent, American accent, right? Many people here are, have been born and raised here. So it's not about another country. It's about here. It's about serving the Muslim community and in general, serving the community, being good citizens. So one of the avenues that I want to bring to your attention, because there was an important point in uh, Sayyid's presentation about professions. Now, there is a range of professions for Muslims. Uh, one of them I would like to bring your attention, draw your attention to is chaplaincy, how Muslims can work as chaplains, as citizens who help with hospitals, prisons, schools, etc. There are various chaplaincy programs now in the United States. The institution where I work started the first one um, back in the early 2000s, and I have brought some literature if anybody is interested in that line. There is also the line of getting professional degrees in religious studies or Islamic studies or even at the PhD level. But then the question could be, what is taught in these programs? What do people learn? How has Islam, this object, an objectified concept called Islam, how has it been talked about, right? And I'm not going to give you a history lesson unless you're interested in the history of Islamic studies, but I'm going to tell you how it is done today. Now, my understanding about this group is that in the beginning, as I said, we are all interested in the legacy of the Ahlul Bayt. Next week, we are going to have Eid Ghadir, right? The most celebrated uh, Shia celebration, right? The most celebrated Shia Eid, right? Specifically Shia. Of course, we celebrate Eid al-Fitr, we celebrate Eid al-Adha. These are important for all Muslims. Specifically, it's Qadir. I want you to take the time and consult the entry on Qadir Khum in the Encyclopedia of Islam, which is presumably one of the most authoritative authoritative sources that every graduate student or even undergraduate student would go to study. I'm not going to tell you what it says, but I want you to see how it is misrepresentative of the Qadir tradition, right? It is divisive and it's extremely important for us as Muslims. And I'm very appreciative of what you said. We're talking about Islam. We're not talking about some specific group, even though we are interested, we may have specific interests in certain traditions. Look up Ghadir Khum in the Encyclopedia of Islam. Look up the biography of certain people who are, in our view, maybe um, problematic characters in the history of Islam and see how they are represented. I'll give you one example that is, again, extremely important to us. And let me say this to kind of frame what I'm going to say. I promised. I'll keep this short. I promised I'll keep it short, and then we, you'll do a question and answer. So for us, followers of the Ahl Bayt, the faithful to the Prophet, who have extreme affection and devotion to the family of the Prophet, we have two pillars, or three pillars, 
for our understanding of the legacy of the Prophet. One of them is exemplified and embodied in the, on the occasion of Ghadir, right? That is a fundamental uh, point of departure. Another one is Karbala. What happened in Karbala? Another one is the occultation of the Imam. These three moments, these three phenomena, these three pillars are integrative and fundamental to what we understand as the school of the Ahlul Bayt. Now, the second one, what happened in the year 61? <clears throat> what happened and what were the consequences of it? There is a very strong trend that goes back to more than 100 years ago, but as I said, I will not give you a history lesson or history lessons, even though, as the sister said, I'm a historian, so I'm, I'm apt to fall into talking about a thousand years ago. I won't. As of 2010, 2012 especially, there is a specific current in Islamic studies that focuses on a rehabilitation of the Umayyad dynasty, not just as a dynasty, but teaching every undergraduate student in the United States that Islam came to be around the year 700. And this 700 is not an accident, right? This is the time of the height of the Umayyad dynasty. So what do we do with that? Do we sit back and let this say, oh yes, this is what happened. Islam was created in the uh, year 700. Nobody knew about the beginnings. We don't really know what happened. What we actually do know is about the year 700 onward. This is wrong. This is false. How is this related to Karbala? Uh, hopefully this was not a non sequitur. The idea that I want to put forward in this group, to this group, is that after 680, there was a concerted effort at redefining and appropriating the legacy and the memory of the Prophet. We find that in the organization of the Quran. We find that in the writing of the seerah of the Prophet. We find that on the writing of a specific trend in the writing down of hadith. So do we sit back and accept what is taught by people who are mere observers of this at best? Who only have a, uh, as they tell us, a distant relationship with the material? Or are we going to participate in this rereading of the history of what Islam means and what Islam is. This is something that is extremely important for Muslims to get involved in. At the academic level, certainly, but also at the public level. You, the people here, um, younger and older, we all, we all have a duty to learn and to teach. We need good books on these topics, not just rewritings of encyclopedia articles, not just translations from Urdu or Arabic or Persian or Turkish, but the rethinking and rewriting. Uh, our children go to school, go to college, they hear things about the, uh, you know, the formation of Islam, about the contents of the Quran, about the authenticity of hadith or lack thereof. It is our collective responsibility to rethink this and to rethink this together and together to prepare uh, writings for the next generation to read and then to produce their own take on this. So higher education and the study of Islam, extremely important for what is going on. Already there is a large number of Muslims who are participating, but as uh, Sayyid said, it is possible for a person to be Muslim and to run a casino. It is possible, even though they may not be good Muslims. It is also possible for some Muslims to do Islamic history, but do it not so very well, or Islamic studies. Thank you. Jazakallah <laughs> khair, Dr. Kamali. Yeah, I think, you know, so much of what you're saying, earlier in the day we had a panel and uh, Sayyid Suleiman brought up the Muhammad Abdu quote, I went to the 
West and saw Islam but no Muslims and went to the East and saw Muslims but no Islam. And I think we're at sort of, you know, I, I feel similarly about Islamic studies departments versus STEM. I go to STEM departments and I find Islam but no, but no Muslims. And I go to the Islamic studies departments and find Muslims but no Islam. Uh, that's obviously an oversimplification. Just to show you what kind of a pedant I am, I would say that the quote is from Sayyid Jamaluddin al-Afghani, oh. who was Muhammad Abdul's teacher. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll do the history lesson afterwards, inshallah. Um, this is why we need our teachers. Um, but I think the, the point, I mean, if we're thinking about why to sort of if we're thinking about the purpose of education and the purpose of learning and the purpose of teaching and sort of the purpose of this being the thing that defines whether or not it's Islamic, you know, the Islamic education is inherently defined by the intention in seeking that education. And when we're thinking about defining like the legacy of Islam, so much of, of Islamic studies, um, Beyond just a concerted effort, I mean, you have people who have absolutely no no skin in the game, no no dog in the fight, who are coming in and making arguments about things that don't matter to them whatsoever. Um, and then you end up not just with uh, with malicious scholarship that is that is intentionally trying to present different narratives, but you end up with scholarship that is just sort of willy nilly and and um, and doesn't make any sense because there's no intentionality behind it. So I think preserving the legacy and getting involved in, in taking control of the narrative is um, of utmost importance and of utmost importance for those who, who think that academic endeavors are the ways that they can best contribute to, to the Yuma um, in the US. We're going, so Jazakallah Khair again. Um, we're going to um, explore one more topic sort of under this umbrella of Islamic education with Dr. Rasul Nagavi, who is the founding director of Mufid Academic Seminary. He holds a PhD from Georgetown University. We, we're all up here like, you know, higher education doesn't matter, but we have our PhDs. <laughs> um, but hopefully um, in our discussion, we can sort of uh, explore more why it's important to pursue higher education and the and the and the place that it holds in an Islamic worldview, but he he holds a PhD from Georgetown University, Department of Arabic and Islamic Studies, and a second PhD from the Islamic Seminary of Qom, Iran, where he studied and taught Islamic law, legal theory, and logic for 16 years. Uh, Dr. Nagavi's academic interests include spirituality, mysticism, and peace building. He has published the following books and many articles, Contemporary Shia Jurisprudence, ah. Two Rakat's story, uh, Two story, and he also has a second MA in peace building and conflict resolution and is active in inter and interfaith dialogue. But his work, his community work and community building speaks for itself. Um, and Mufid Seminary, I think, is one of the sort of um, one of the examples for us as we think about imagining what religious institutions and what Islamic institutions in this country can and should look like. So I'll hand the mic to you whenever you're ready. Bismillah. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I really enjoyed uh, the conversation that you started, Sister Sara, and then uh, Brother Rizvi, and of course Dr. Kamali, and I really enjoyed. Um, what we can actually learn uh, just from the mood of the discussion and how it goes. Um, I want to mention two points. Uh, number one, I will touch base on the Islam, Islamic education in general, and then we'll go move to the institutions. And I try to just mention one institution that I know more, which is Mufid Academic Seminary, and some of the reasons that we started this, um, and how it is moving to become, inshallah, with your prayers, Mufid College. We have, we have just applied, and inshallah, within a couple of years, we're hoping that we become a small Islamic college <clears throat> with your prayers. Um, so on the topic of Islamic education, um, and the meaning of holistic education, 
Um, I just want to mention one point that that is the similarity that I see um, when I'm trying to see put my Western education and the Islamic education that I had in Qom together. I came to the U.S. after 16 years of studies in Qom. And I sat in a class to study Islam with a non with a non-Muslim female scholar. It was it was really hard for me. Um, there was part of me which was saying, Rasul, look, you were teaching, you were like a good teacher there in Qom for many years, and now you're sitting in a class with a non-Muslim scholar to learn Islam. Um, this hadith of Khuz al-Hikmah, take wisdom from everybody, doesn't matter the religion, was at the back of my mind. But honestly, it took me a lot of time to convince myself that I have to learn. There are many things that I can learn. I knew at the back of my mind uh, that this Western education has a lot to offer to me, but I had to go through this personal challenge to convince myself. And I started asking myself, why? Why should I have this challenge? What is the difference? Is there any difference between science and Islam and the methods that we study? Then, eventually, that was, this was the way that I responded to my personal challenge. I said, look, Islam is a language and science is a language. Both of these languages are trying to convey truth to us. It doesn't matter which one you're taking, as long as you're trying to find truth. As soon as this became more obvious to me, I started to see everyone who is working in chemistry or as a physician or as a scientist, I started looking at them like looking at Mufassirin. Because the people who were doing tafsir of Quran, they were doing the tafsir of the kalam and the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the people who were working in the science, science departments as a physician, as a, I mean, all of these different sciences, they were trying to do tafsir of the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of a sudden, I started to respect both on the same level. It doesn't matter if they were doing the tafsir of Quran or if they were doing the tafsir of the work of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, both of them were mufassirs and both of them had my respect. It was as if having Quran, science, Bible, all of the Old Testament, New Testament, other books, all of the scientific discoveries in front of me and looking for truth and knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is among all of them. Seeing Islam as a language and seeing science also as a language was the way to kind of for me to bring it together. So, the question was why this happened to me? This was so clear. I think it happened to me because we didn't, I didn't have, I had to kind of um, reread everything that I had in Qom. I had to uh, translate everything that I learned back in Qom. Why? Because it was totally new environment. It was like a tree which studied and grew in Qom for like 
20 years and now you take the tree off and you want to bring it to DC and implant the tree here. It was not working well. I was like, oh, probably we need something else. The rewriting that Dr. Kamali mentioned, I think was the main idea of thinking of a higher of establishing of a higher educational institution. Because when you have a scholars grew up in Qom, grew up in Najaf, and when you take that tree and bring it and implement, implement it here in, in the US, there are a lot of challenges that he needs to go through, the challenges that I had. How would you be able to avoid that well, you will preserve the authenticity, of course, that you have it in Qom and Najaf. But what about the adaptability? But what about the relevancy? The relevancy and adaptability is the main element for preserving any tradition. So if you wanted to preserve a tradition, you need two things. You need authenticity. And you need adaptability. Even, even the tradition of a common law in the US, right? You're not able to change law constitution every moment. Why? Because, you know, they want to preserve the authenticity of law. If you were changing it every second, that wouldn't be a law, that wouldn't be a constitution. So you need authenticity, continuity but you also need adaptability and change. I feel what we have back home gives us authenticity, gives us continuity, but lacks one thing. It lacks the relevancy. That's why we were not able to connect to many of our youth because we were not relevant enough. That was the whole idea of having a seminary and, and inshallah transitioning it to a college here in the US. Every, a lot of people were telling me, Rasul, like you will be, a, like people go to Qom or people study in Qom and they come here. And I'm like, that's not gonna work. The relevancy of a students like you guys, the way that you are able to translate the message of Islam to your context it's not gonna be possible by someone who was grew up who grew up in Qom or who is, is residing in Qom or anywhere else. We need to have. Uh, let's go back to the seminary of Qom. You know, seminary of Qom was established by like, like about a hundred years ago. 1992 um, is the time that um, I'm not a historian, so I'm. <laughs> 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 21, exactly, it was close enough. <laughs> it's the time that Ayatollah Hayri Shirazi um, starts uh, est start the Islamic Seminary of Qom. So, so what I'm thinking is that when people are telling me, no, 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 when you establish something here, it's not authentic. I'm like, be patient, be patient. You don't get your authenticity from a city. You get, your, you get your authenticity from your book. You get your authenticity from how you're close to truth, which comes from all of the sources that I mentioned, which comes from your tradition, which comes from Quran, which comes from a hadith, which comes from any other language which is translating the truth, including science. Including science. So I think that was the whole idea and that's that's what I mean by um, by Islamic institutions who are trying to preserve this tradition for the upcoming generations inshallah. Let's let me stop here and then inshallah if we had time would I would be happy to talk more about what is Mufid and um, and of course I think uh, Dr. Kamali has to talk also about the uh, the Imam Ali chair and also another chair which pr are primarily doing the same thing like Shia studies as a chair and inshallah becoming more than a chair or thinking about a center. So let's let's transition to more institutions and then we, I, if there was any any questions I would be happy to 
to get back on that. Jazakallah khair, salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Shaykh, thank you so much. That was that was um, that was lovely, and I love I love the metaphor of the tree. I think the tree is a really good image, and if we think of ourselves as trees, and think of all the thing that goes into making a tree, you know, like the tree is accustomed to the amount of sunlight it gets relative to the other trees around it, and the source of water is it a polluted source of water? Like, is the water like too high in in one kind of mineral or another kind of mineral? Um, where is the sunlight hitting from? What is the, what are the insects and the sort of things that surround the tree? How is the tree coming up? And if we think of ourselves as trees that we, our goal is to produce fruit. You know, we begin as a sapling and we want to grow and we want to be able to produce fruit and that whether that is art or whether, whether that is the work we do with our hands or whether that is, um, building a family, whatever, whatever kind of fruit we beget, it all has to do with how, with the environment that we as trees come up in. And this is a really sort of key aspect of tarbiya and a key aspect of coming up is like, what, where is our water source? Where is our sunlight source? What are the other trees and insects and environs that surround us that will enable us to beget good fruit? So I don't know if, um, if one of you wants to begin um, by talking about the importance of sort of environment in education, like when we're talking about educating and bringing up good individuals, um, good individuals who are inclining towards God, you know, if God is the, the sunlight and this extended metaphor, um, how should we be thinking about that when we're thinking about schools and universities and, and the institutions um, we're building? I'm a teacher, so I work with students who actually build community centers and schools for their communities. I've had students from Turkey, from Albania, um, from South Asia, from Togo and Africa, Senegal, who are actually in this line of work in bringing this tradition to the communities. And I talk to them, I advise them on their projects and their theses, and there are many elements that are similar, that are the same. Um, especially because immigrant communities are very diverse, right? Some may only be interested in the language of the motherland, not so much in the religion. Um, some people may be very much interested in religion and less so in cultural things, I mean, the language that is used. Um, so this is, a, this, is a, this is an immigrant pro pro problem. This is an immigrant problem. It's for every us. Every community has this. And I think in addition to using such very powerful metaphors as a tree, sunlight, you know, organic metaphors, we also need to think in terms of social reality. We need to think about class, social mobility. Again, this was in Sayyid Rizvi's uh, point about professions. People want their children um, to thrive. And it is unfair to the next generation to raise them according to the values of another time and another place. There is a saying attributed to Imam Ali, again, because everything has to go back to the source, who said, presumably, raise your children for the times they live in. Raise your children for their time, not for your time. And this is extremely important in tarbiyah. You're not going to copy yourself. This is not a good model of teaching. In my view, I'm older, I'm a little bit jaded, I'm a teacher, so, uh, and I'm not, you know, I, I don't work with young people as students. So, you know, I look at it from the outside, and I think it is extremely important to also have this social dimension, this um, economic, social uh, dimension, as well as the metaphorical ideas of um, planting trees, 
uprooting trees and uh, contaminated water or pure air. All of that is beautiful. All of that is apt. But we also need to think in terms of more concrete uh, terms. For example, if you want to have a college, what does it take to be a college and not go bankrupt in five years? If you're really in this, into this, right? You don't want to start something. <laughs> they have this money. <laughs> what is that? Is there a, a precedent? If there is a precedent or? I, I, don't, I didn't get the. Uh, so there are many examples of institutions have been built. Schools, for example, mosques. And all of it coming out of goodwill. Right? But then, so you have to think about, in addition to good will, you know, yes, all actions are judged by God according to, to intentions. But having good intentions is not enough for this worldly action. God judges, yes, we are told, God judges by intentions. That doesn't mean that having good intentions suffice in this world. These are important points, you know, as obvious as they may be. But I think um, we need to sometimes um, talk about the concrete realities on the ground. For example, when we talk about tarbiyah, whether it is possible to do it by people who reside in Qom or go to Qom and study and come back or have studied in Qom or you know, have a traditional education. The point is, there are contemporary issues, whether you learn them in Qom or in Harvard, it doesn't matter. But these are questions that we need to be sensitive to. What do we teach in an Islamic school or Islamic college about the environment? Right? Have you ever thought about it? Beyond what you hear on the news that may be at this pace in another generation, two generations, three generations, there will not be enough water for a big part of the population of the world. And this is a reality now. How, what do we teach our communities, not only children? How do we discuss questions of medical ethics? Extremely important questions. Right? Medical ethics. These are concrete realities that are not just some metaphorical um, do good. Doing good is absolutely necessary. But the way we think about the good is not simply through um, simplifying beautiful metaphors. Right? I think that is also important to, especially to, to inject into, into plans of making schools or colleges or any, any programs, academic programs, that concrete reality of what will happen to the graduates of this program. My question has been, what happens to the graduates of the Zaytuna College? Mm -hmm. What happens to the um, people who graduate from chaplaincy programs at Hartford or uh, Chicago or elsewhere? What happens to them? And this is, again, the tree is important, but this is not just the tree, right? This is the lifeline. How is this man or woman going to earn a living and to do good work, and, and what is that person going to present at the prison or at a hospital, right? You see, these are the concrete issues that I want to bring to the attention of everyone. I think, I think you hit on a lot of the topics I wanted to touch on, and I think the, the object of the tree metaphor is sort of to underscore this point, you know? The, the fruits are not just, you know, recitation of the Quran, the fruits ideally are work and whether that's in the climate sector or whether that's in, I think by creating good individuals, ultimately we create individuals who do good work. Um, and that should be our priority. Um, Islamic education is not just about the Quran as, as we've been discussing or about these rituals. It's about creating individuals who, who do good and beget good. Um, inshallah, why don't we open it up to the audience for questions? Since uh, may Allah bless you all for your amazing perspective. I think all, each and all, every one of you brought a different aspect to this uh, important uh, category. Um, my question is, 
you know, be, being a past president of a local Jamaat uh, in New York, you know, especially during COVID time, you saw so many Islamic scholars struggling to earn a living. And it's, a, it, it's always looked upon as a profession that is very difficult to survive in, um, with very little assistance. Now, as a parent whose son wants to go to Hausa, for example, and Islamic studies, how, how can we, as, a, as parents, you know, like say, say this just said, you know, his father was very supportive, but you can't shake the fact that you want your child to be secured and, and be able to live that responsibility when he, inshallah, has a wife, has children. It's not cheap to survive in this country, mm -hmm. right? You talk about uprooting a tree here, it's, it's not cheap to maintain that tree, right? Uh, it's, it's expensive, and how, when, when one devotes their four, five, six years of their life after university, hopefully here, to go there, um, or even in your institute here, and come back and restart, um, how, how can we get that sense of security? You know, this particular line of track is going to keep you secured, inshallah. And for him as well, in terms of what guidance is there available out there of what type of careers to pick, you know, what type of specialty to pick, whereby when they come back, they have possibility of a, of a job or a career within that field. And honestly, the reason why I reference uh, the past being vice president because, you know, we were aware of so many scholars during that time who, because everything got shut down, nobody was getting invited. And you have, even as of today, you have scholars who are driving Ubers just to survive, right? And you devote half of your life towards this cause, which is an amazing cause. But we can't escape the fact that there is a lot of um, anxiety that comes with its future and its sustainability. If you can just shed some light on that, please. So I think there's a few different angles to look um, and try to grasp how to even approach a question like that. One is just, again, talking about uh, get, you know sources of income and, and careers and professions and making money. Uh, I, I want to take it back, again, since we're relating it to, as you were saying, a centers in community. In general, my, in my humble opinion, I think in general, our communities have completely misunderstood and gotten the idea of the Islamic financial and social welfare system wrong. Like they have just no clue what it is. It's just getting donations, building centers, going bigger and bigger and bigger, thinking people will fill it up, they'll donate more. And then what do we do? Well, we can afford bigger speakers or something, you know, that's it. It's just this weird sort of idea of just grabbing money, utilizing homes for this, and just kind of building and building and building. Now, social welfare is really not the kind of aspect that we're talking about, but, and I know the focus here is about Islamic education. But I'm not part of academia, but I, I'm very, I understand that the same thing does exist in academia too. There is always this fear that research grants will not or won't come in. Uh, will I get paid properly? You know, I need to get published, all these other types of things, right? I hope I'm not bringing up trauma for either of you guys, but. I'm yeah, <laughs> alhamdulillah. So the Western academic system, they have their own sort of system of what they want to do to increase and move things beyond. You'll have, let's say, companies or corporations saying, hey, you know, this AI stuff sounds pretty good. We can profit off that. Yeah, we'll fund you. We'll take care of that for you. Uh, and again, I forgive me for speaking in front of a historian like this. It's important for us to figure out, OK, I know we don't want to take it back 1,400 years, but it, it's at least helpful if we're trying to figure out the quote unquote Islamic version of something. Well, let's at least see how it was done 1,400 years ago. There was clearly this system of education, Islamic education, right? Uh, if you want to call it the Hausa, call it that, whatever. Students of the Imams or, you know, post Imam. What were they doing? How are they earning? All right, there's some semi-famous examples where you had some of the ulama who were just, they owned a lot of land. They had a lot of wealth and they would be the ones who were just making it rain for the students, right? They were just taking care of the stipends for everybody. And that was just a known sort of system. Uh, the, within like Beit Ulman and the Islamic sort of system, this was just a part of it. This is something that gets kind of taken care of. And, you know, even, you know, I remember we were having a discussion about this in another regard, like the way that you think about even a different position, like the Mu'advin, somebody who recites Adhan. Right now, it's more of a, in terms of centers, it's sort of this find somebody that will begrudgingly agree to recite the Adhan, right? That's how it is. But according to many fuqaha, this was a paid position. You find somebody who has a beautiful voice, that understands the timings of salat, there's all these conditions and mustahabat and everything. 
They know what to do, where to go, at what time, and they're attracting people to Salah for this. And they were getting paid from Bayt al from this. This was a, in a sense, I don't want to call it a profession, but this is something. So now when we're talking about education, it's the, this Islamic financial system, it, it does, is it a part of it or not? Or is it just about, no, this, whatever, the, the money's collected and it's spent on, okay, no, charity, fine, poor, needy, the fuqara, that's part of it. Uh, making, again, more and more buildings, sure. But if those buildings are going to be buildings where there's no ilm present and there's no ta'aleem and ta'alam, there's no education, what's really the point of that? And again, I don't actually think that the centers are centers of knowledge in the first place, when I mean an Islamic center. These educational centers are there to say, look, the masajid, the imam barga, whatever word you want to use, that's a place of tadhakkur and dhikr. That's a place of remembrance, meaning you have some semblance of education already. You're coming there to get reminders, to get reconnected to God. You dropped it a little bit. You know, sometimes people say, you know, I, I want the speaker to be able to, you know, educate us a lot more. Well, is that actually the purpose of the member in the first place? Right? The educational institutions seem, I don't say divorced, but it seems like it's, it's, it's following a different track. And you start to see now that there are these institutes and places which are, in a sense, separating, saying, look, we've got a center, Islamic center, Masjid, Husseiniyah, that takes care of the more cultural expressions of Islam, reminds people, gets them connected to the Ahlul Bayt. But then in terms of education, we have to keep it a bit separate there because this is a different sense of how you want to approach it. So there has to be some sort of budget allocated for that. Now, again, we can sit here and we can, again, discuss you know, various Western capitalistic economic theories about what will work and how we divide it up. Or we can kind of go back and say, has Islam already kind of given us some sort of model for this, whether very directly or no, in the kind of seat of the ulama, that they seem to have left a system there. And again, we have many, alhamdulillah, people who are very wealthy, great entrepreneurs in our community. And I'm sure they, they take care of many projects locally, internationally, that's great. But is this idea of funding education a part of their financial agenda or not? That, hey, I have to step this up and you know, cut out a certain part of my budget for these things to go. So for me, I think that's the part that if you're looking to build up that support system, it has to come from the community understanding what the Islamic kind of financial system really is about. Can I add one point? Please, please okay. go ahead. So um, I think the problem that you mentioned is coming from the same problem that I mentioned at the beginning. I think the scholars that you were mentioning are again the product of trying to implant a tree which was from another culture to a new culture. If you have American, I mean, people who grew up here and they are, they have studied Islam and they are Muslim scholars and they do not have enough job, bring them to me. We have a lot of job for them. The problem that you see that some of the scholars do not have centers, I think it's because of the relevancy. It's all because of the relevancy of the messages. And it's all because, um, I, I, that's, that's one, one answer that I, that I have for you. And the other one is that it's not only our masajid. Um, part of my own living, is coming from teaching in different universities. They teach Muslim intellectual history in a university in Baltimore. And what Dr. Kamali mentioned about chaplaincy, there are all different types that exist there. If you are, again, a scholar of Islam who, is, who was able to um, basically be relevant to the community here, we, have, we lack a lot of them right now. Right now, I mean, if you have, bring them up. Um, hi, so my question is kind of um, to all three of you, I guess, because, um, so I'm a neuroscience major, so going into my fourth year. And so we, what you've been talking about, Islamic studies at the university and academic level, um, I'm sort of wondering, I know it was this was touched on a little bit as like, people who are studying science and are becoming scientists, you know, as trying to interpret um, a less creation. And I thought that was like really powerful and impactful and something I'll definitely be thinking about for a long time. But what I want to ask is how could I possibly implement that in like my actual studies, like what I'm actually doing? Like, I know we had this example of the sun and like, you know, trying to like 
talk about the sun from the from talking about like Quran and then talking about like what it's physically doing in the natural world and then talking about its role in like the harat and the jasad but like beyond that sort of simple example and thinking about you know my responsibility as a scientist and like as a representative of this Islam you know like I wear a hijab like that's what people are going to think about me but just thinking about those things in general like and at a higher level of education how can I implement that? I'm thinking about the previous question. Yeah. The gentleman here of religious training as you may have and many people here if a person performs a religious rite for payment that annuls that performance right so it's not as easy as Islam has a solution no religion is not for people to make a living from it's about service at the same time again going to the social dimension of it the community has a responsibility to look after those who dedicate their lives to the study of the tradition right and various traditions have done this the uh, indian tradition the buddhist tradition the jewish tradition the christian tradition and the muslim tradition and they've done it in different ways right so that is again not something that can be discussed here uh, at this round table how are we going to do or there is a model let's go back to it no there isn't this is the United States with its own tax code, with its own requirements, job requirements. So we cannot go back to the madrasa system of the 11th century or the 12th century, right? the madrasa nizamiya system, and implement it here. It's not going to work. The question that you raise is a fundamental social question. Many congregations have shut down. It's not just Muslim congregations. It's Christian congregations. I have two colleagues who have received a million dollar grant, I think a Lilly grant, to study churches during COVID. And now they have extended the research into mosques, right? It's a big problem. One of the issues that we need to recognize is that we need to think beyond uh, simple stories and narratives of, oh, you have to do this. No, we have to, these are social problems, so they have to be addressed socially. Again, I'm not here to sell you the package from Hartford for chaplaincy, but I thought it's a good idea to share that. See, there is a income bracket. What is the median income in the United States? 65K. Anyone? 65K, right? And the average is lower. That's the median, right? So how much does a teacher earn? in the New York City public school system? So these are questions to ask. See, these, is, these are not just vague uh, metaphysical questions. What, how much do teachers make in Sayreville, New Jersey, or in, in uh, New Brunswick? These are different. So every community has to figure that out for themselves. It's a serious decision to think about, right? And as you say, as, and I try to say that as well, it is every parent's responsibility what is the first responsibility of the parent? To give a good name to the child, right? That's what the hadith tells us. That is the first one. And then to raise them with faith and to think about their future, to teach them a craft, right? To teach them a good craft. Uh, these are all from a thousand years ago, still applicable, but then one has to understand it within this context. It is not just, I want to go and become a monk in, you know, in Sri Lanka which is very similar. There may be a religious sentiment. It's extremely important. So what some people do, and this is not entirely alien to Muslim history, is that they receive some basic training in their childhood. This is the tarbiya. They go to a Muslim school, Saturday school, Sunday school. They learn about hadith. You know, this, is, this has very deep roots in Muslim history. People would take their sons and daughters to hadith sessions when they were probably five years old. They couldn't write. So the father or the uncle would write for them and they would have a mashikha, uh, right? They would, have a, uh, they would have a list of hadith that they had heard. Then they would go and live their lives. They'd become 65 years old, 60 years old, 50 years old. 
they would retire. They would stop being merchants or they would be shopkeepers and then they would narrate hadith at the local mosque. So a lot of material that we have from the muhaddithun, from the 11th, 12th centuries, for example, are this type of people. They had a job. How do we know this? We know this by their professional titles. Fulan ibn Fulan al-Jassas, right? Fulan ibn Fulan al-Warraq. Fulan ibn Fulan and uh, Kazaz. They had job titles. Right? So they actually worked. Now, this community provides some possibilities for other work. This is what we see in Muslim countries during the modernization, Turkey, Iran, elsewhere. To allow it for the religiously learned people to become teachers, school teachers, to work in the legal system. Right? This, is, this is the experience that various countries have had. And maybe many people here, their parents have come from that line. They became civil servants with some knowledge of Islam, and at the same time, they performed the service. This is what needs to be thought for the community. Again, beyond metaphors and things. Now, about uh, neuroscience and how it's not just neuroscience, it's about any, <clears throat> any field of study. Um, there is no way of being, and let me qualify myself, we are being recorded. Um, there is no proper or specific or single way of being a good Muslim neuroscientist. It's not gonna, if you wanna be a good Muslim neuroscientist, first you have to be a good neuroscientist and you have to be a good Muslim. That would be a good Muslim neuroscientist. Otherwise there's nothing that a Muslim would do in her research that another uh, person would not do. So this, this discussion of science and religion is extremely important. Um, Dr. Nagavi used the um, similarity with language. You know, that's a great, very powerful metaphor, comparison, but languages are in principle translatable to each other. So if I am speaking to you in English, I could say the same thing to you in French and you would understand it, or in Arabic, or in Urdu, or in Persian. I would be saying the same thing. Are we saying that chemistry and kalam are saying the same thing? Probably not. I don't know your position on it, but it's not as simple as two languages. They, are, they have different vocabularies, they have different grammars, they have different <laughs> pragmatics, you know, syntax, semantics, morphology, everything is different. So again, these are serious questions that beg serious answers. And I'm, you know, I'm just trying to say we need, as Islamic education, raise the bar. Raise the bar in every instance. Whatever question is posed, raise the bar. What do you mean? What do you mean by language? What do you mean by tree? What do you mean by thriving? What do you mean by profession? What do you mean by tarbiyah? Creating and strengthening the discourse. No, thank you, Jazakallah. I think something you hit on that's really, um, I'll, I'll get them in a moment. Uh, I think something you hit on that's really important is this idea of just being a good neuroscientist. And I think like ultimately, the Islamic way to do anything is with Ihsan. The, the way to make something Islamic is to do it properly the way it is meant to be done. Be good. Do something, and if you're going to do it, do it properly um, to, the, to the extent that it can be. And that's the way to be the best Muslim neuroscientist or the best Muslim anything is to just be the best in that field. And I think, you know, we're at a moment where Unfortunately, mediocrity is rewarded. You know, we have like sort of identity politics and we're in a milieu where as if you do something, even if you do it poorly, you can be rewarded for that thing. And I think as Muslims, we should be at the forefront of doing things as best as they can be done. Thank you very much, Pan, the very interesting uh, talks by the whole, every panel. Question related to concrete realities, and um, you mentioned about Encyclopedia Islam referring to certain events of historical importance, misrepresentative. Um, how do we change the narrative? Islamic education, we are, are we going to teach the same concepts that have been going coming in from centuries? We are researching the same books, same things or we are going to build our own narratives. 
and the narratives are changing. Technology has advanced. So you you know all of these about generative AIs, chat GPTs, all these things. They are going to be writing our narratives their way. How are we going to do that? Um, I think the way to change is to have a problem-solving approach in our faith and in our religion. What do I mean by that? By that, I mean see what are the problems of your 21st century US. The problem that we have is that we are following Prophet Muhammad's 7th century, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, 7th century Hijaz context. What, you, what we need to do is to imagine what Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam in 21st century DMV area or US context would do and then you follow that prophet. The problem is that we follow Imam Hussein alayhi salam who existed many, many, many centuries ago but we do not imagine what would Imam Hussein alayhi salam do, what social movement Imam Hussein alayhi salam would support in the 21st century US context. If you have that problem solving approach, I think you would be able, you would be able to easily come front and say I have something. So the way that I look at religion is that I see me and my scientist uh, partner next to me sitting around one table, science and religion are sitting around one table and there is a problem on the table. Again, this is the metaphor I'm trying to use. And what are those problems? Those problems are our global warming. Those problems are environment that Dr. Kamali mentions. Those problems are the unjust, social injustice that, you, that we see. So these are all of the problems that exist on the table. So what would you be able to do to solve this problem? How the teachings of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is gonna be able to, to help the Muslim community to have a better understanding of respect of the rights of nature. You see the transition, there's a very interesting transition that happened in Iran, and there are, I have a lot of the, the different examples. My, my, uh, my, my PhD dissertation was about all of these changes that happened in the history of Muslim tradition, and this is one of them. So, so you see that um, uh, there is a culture in Iran that in the 13th of Nuruz, because 13 was kind of, I mean, it still is bad. This, this, this hotel doesn't have a 13th floor or, right? It's still, they're thinking about it. So, so they were going out, right? They were going out. And eventually, a change happened. So they were going out. There was nothing Islamic about going out. Eventually, that ch changed, right? Eventually, they named the day not as Sizda or 13, they named it as the Nature Day, Ruzet Habiat, right? So all, and all of a sudden, all of the narrations and the traditions which was about the rights of nature was being preached during that day. So what happened is that there is something in the community which people are following. There is a religion, which there is a problem in the community, and you see how Islam and the tradition that you have is able to solve this problem. Very simple example. So the same goes with any other example that you have in the, you have it in the, uh, in, in, in your society. My approach is, if religion is not solving a problem, it will die. Period. It will die because it is not relevant. And for, for, for anything to exist, it needs both at the same time. It needs authenticity and relevancy at the same time. Authenticity is not enough. Relevancy is not enough. Both matters. It's not about narrative. You know, narrative is that you have a story, I have a story. Um, it's, it's about, it has to be about, there has to be some relevant truth 
that work. It's not just about ChatGPT or, you know, this is what uh, X at Princeton says, this is what Y at uh, Georgetown says, and you know, these, these are narratives. Um, it's not just about narrative. It's, it's very much germane to the way we look at the world, we live our lives, and despite everything that has been said about um, relativism, etc., I heard that you work on postmodernism. Um, there is there is an idea of truth that needs to be insisted upon, right? With all its difficulties, with all its difficulties. The point about um, rewriting or retelling, rewriting with an R, not just W, right? Rewriting. Thank you. Jazakallah khair. I want to give you the opportunity to make some closing remarks too because we, we heard from our two esteemed yes. speakers. So if you'd like to, to close on something, please. So I'm going to first go back to that one and then back to the neuroscience question, if you don't mind. So as I was hearing their wonderful responses about this idea of you know, asking for, about narratives and recreating or creating narratives, uh, and maybe it's just me, but for me, there's still all these fundamental questions that are left unanswered when trying to even approach that idea, is that there are already these presumed sort of meta-narratives that we've taken into consideration that allows us to approach these sort of things. So for example, we're talking about you know, these questions, can they be answered by the literal historical sita of the, you know, of the Ahlul Bayt? Or is it, no, there's these principles that we kind of loosely understand, and then they need to be sort of, quote unquote, updated, reinterpreted, whatever word, evolved, right? There's many charged words that you can use, right? So my bias is more for the, the former. So when we're talking about, again, languages, so now I'm gonna use the neuroscience example. So there's a easy way to sort of, one way to answer it that, okay, a person involved in mathematics, studying mathematics, technically there's no God in there. Like you don't need to believe in Islam to you know, come up with some new ma you know, mathematical axiom. It's unnecessary. You're studying neuroscience, people can argue, what does it have to do with God, right? So yeah, be a good Muslim and do good neuroscience and that's it. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with people like these, you know, now neuroscience is like one of these hot button things, right? Uh, and influencers are jumping on it. Like I think, uh, what's his name? Dr. Andrew Huberman, right? A lot of people follow him. Advice on, you know, getting energy and, and you know, stack these, nootropics, all that kind of stuff. Mushrooms. Mushrooms. <laughs> That's a separate workshop we talk about there. <laughs> the real airfon, right? Okay. So. I met like lion's mane and those things at the. So yeah, so did I, yeah, so did I, of course. Of course I did. <laughs> <laughs> <That's a laughs> so there's obviously one way we say look this is scientific evidence this is the empirical method you take it and that's it you're, you're done with it that's again a narrative there like the prophet Sira has what does it have to do with this nothing this is they didn't have it back then we have improvements now and that's how we figure it out there's another which again I want to know that this is my bias is that no there is a separate sort of language which is this metaphysical spiritual language which dominates over the physical world which, when somebody's using this one sort of empirical scientific language, they're looking through reality through uh, with, with goggles, with lenses, and it's like tunnel vision. There's a whole realm that they are denying. In the same way, it would apply for anything in any of the physical sciences. So now for somebody else who, let's say, has some sort of training in the metaphysical sciences, they are now able to kind of use that to determine some of the borders that they're looking at, right? Like nowadays, Fasting, we would always argue as, I don't know, I, I argued when I was younger, like this is a, what's the point, doesn't make any sense. But the minute, forgive me, some white guys say intermittent fasting is great, like yes, subhanAllah, yeah, now it's awesome. It's like, okay, you know, uh, whether it's and both the Andrews, whether Tate or Huberman, right? Anybody who's like, you know, you gotta be an alpha, you gotta get up in the morning and do all this. Well, when Islam was saying, you know, wake up for namaz al shab salatul layl, it was a joke. Like, you know, I gotta wake up in the, you know, I gotta wake up for work, I can't do this, it'll mess me up, I need eight hours of sleep, that's what science says. But, oh, these influencers are all saying it. So, again, I, I know it's a, kind of a superficial point, but it's almost as if they are grabbing the points that were already made in the past. Again, I, I don't want to make it seem like I'm giving some like Wahhabi literalist sort of idea, but, I mean, that is my sincere belief is, if one narrative is saying that, look, there's, there were principles there that were adapted and given to the people of the time because of certain deficiencies and that has to be improved, that's one. There is another narrative that says, look, there was an ideal, the attempt at creating an ideal civilization using these principles. Now that society has moved away from that, 
which is why somebody can be a boy in the morning, a girl in the afternoon, and identify as a toilet at night, right? So is it that we have to update now to speak in their language, or is that no, Islam was trying to keep people within this certain realm of reality using these principles, and yeah, maybe we do have to kind of revert back to this sort of objective understanding, which starts with the you know, metaphysical realm and then kind of moves its way down. There's a lot to say that. Again, my whole point was to say that there's, for me, I, again, I get the whole sort of language analogy there, but for me at least there's clear differences in epistemic value when you're talking about revelation, when you're talking about spirituality, philosophy, metaphysics proper, all these things, versus, let's say, the, the physical sciences. Even if we're talking about, let's just say, medicine in general. I mean, my, my own father, you know, he had a stroke and in the hospital, on his deathbed pretty much, and, you know, these atheistic doctors were saying, look, this, there's no quality of life here. Just pull the plug. If it was my dad, that's what I would do. So this is dominated even in like the medical industry. Many doctors will just push for these kind of things. And this doesn't just happen here, it happens with childbirth, any of these things. So the, their interpretation and understanding of reality is now coming out in their implementation of these various sciences. Mental health, oh, that's a whole separate workshop, right? Because now you have, again, Muslims who are trained in the, whatever, you know, school of Jung or uh, Freud or whatever, and they are trying to, I'd say, force feed that onto Muslims that this is the way that we have to examine and understand the mental health and the soul and things like that. So, okay, well, we have a whole system in Islam, whether you agree with it or not, that's debatable. All right, yeah, we have a whole system dedicated for this, that, you know, your whole dark Cartesian mind-body system that you're talking about, we may not believe in that, actually. We might have to say that, no, there's something that's happening with the person's soul, which then, when you go lower down, affects, let's say, the mental realm or the, the mind, and then affects the body. Well, you have to be able to understand it from that, you know, top-down system, which it's not going to happen in a Western system, pretty much, although uh, maybe there is some school out there that I don't know about. Absolutely. Jazakallah khair. I mean, I think like what we're getting at is that there are so many indigenously Islamic work that has already been done on like sort of piecing together, you know, an ontology, you know, how the world works, how the soul world works in relation to the world, what, how we gain knowledge. Um, this all exists within the tradition. And I think this is what we need to bring into our institutions that we're building, inshallah, and into our Islamic education, you know, beyond, beyond fiqh, beyond, we think teaching Islam is teaching what's halal and haram, but no, there's, there's a whole system that exists and it's there for the taking and inshallah, implementing um, in all our fields, neuroscience, psychology, all these um, different things. So inshallah, I hope that we are able to do that. Um, I pray that we're all able to um, seek uh, knowledge that is of benefit, that we're all able to um, purify our hearts through the knowledge that we seek and purify our hearts so that Allah gives us knowledge. Because we know Islamically, Allah only gives us knowledge if we, um, if we incline towards Him and we purify our hearts. You know, the, the aql, um, is is intimately tied to the state of our hearts. So, Allahumma zidna alman nafi'a. May Allah give us knowledge of benefit. May Allah um, preserve our teachers and our scholars and uh, allow us to follow in their footsteps. Inshallah, ameen. Sallallahu alayhi wa 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 al